Hey, it's Zedrin again, here with part 4 of a Clip Studio Paint animation tutorial. Last time we went through the cleanup process of making polished line art, and now we're on the final phase, or at least one of them, coloring. This step actually isn't terribly difficult, if you set things up the right way anyway. CSP has some tools that blend beautifully with the animation process that make this even easier. The way I'm going to show you how to color hinges on the reference layer property, which can be applied to any item or items in the layer panel. In particular, I'm going to set up the Liner Animation folder to be my reference layer. To enable a reference layer, you can click this little lighthouse button here. I've personally actually bound it to a hotkey just so I can do it faster. Either way, a lighthouse icon will appear next to whatever it is that you're referencing. Normally when you make a group of reference layers, CSP will refer to every visible layer. However, with animation folders, only one layer is visible at a time. As a result, we're only referring to one line art drawing at a time. The next step is to make yet another animation folder and put it below the line art animation folder. Next, via the timeline, we're going to make a bunch of new animation cells, timing them up to match the timings of the line art folders. If I have any frames or cells that were used multiple times, I need to use specify cells to do that same process here. One other thing in my approach is I'm only planning to use one color layer per frame. If you're somebody who likes to use multiple layers for coloring, you can still do that, but it's going to make things a lot more complicated. If you want to use multiple layers, I will cover a method for doing that at the end, but for now we're going to stick to one color layer per frame. When I have my timing sorted out, I'm now just going to take any color that I want to use as a base. You can use a color that's very prevalent in your drawing, or just a color that's very easy for you to see versus your background. I'm going to use Alt plus Delete to fill the entire frame with that solid color. Next I'm going to use the magic wand tool, which is hotkey to W. I've adjusted some of the settings here to refer to only reference layers. Here's a list of the settings. For the settings, we want to make sure that the area scaling is turned off in particular, and naturally we want our selections to apply only to adjacent pixels. For color margin and gap closure, you can set what's most comfortable for you. By far, however, the most important settings that we will mess with here is that it is set to refer to multiple and only refers to the lighthouse icon, aka the reference layer. We also want to make sure that we fill up to the vector path and include the vector path. This will guarantee that our fills go directly under the center line of the strokes. Also, you probably want to have anti-aliasing turned off, especially if you're using vector layers, but sometimes it might be useful. On my first color frame, I'm just going to use the magic wand tool, grab anything that isn't part of Hero, and delete it. This creates a mat of his character. The easiest way to do this is actually to fill every single cell with this whole fill color, and then go through each individual one and cut things out. That way you're not going back and forth as much. For the demonstration purposes of this tutorial, I am actually cutting out the mat for each individual cell first. But one thing you will quickly learn about animation is a lot of it is working smarter, not harder. Additionally, during this phase, I can go through and I can fix up any line art issues that I might have. Again, it's very important to close gaps, and if I'm noticing any gaps preemptively, I want to seal those off. Do note as well, if you really want to, you can just fill the colors in directly. I personally like getting an alpha mat before doing anything, however. One advantage of doing a mat is that it also will fill in any tiny gaps that you wouldn't normally see. When the alpha mat is complete, I'm going to select all the frames we just filled in and lock their transparency with this button up here. Now we can finally color our drawings. The process isn't really too complicated, just choose the colors that you need to use and go through each frame and fill them in as appropriate. One common tip that I would recommend is do it by color. Instead of coloring everything in on the first frame first, do just the hair on the first frame, go to the next frame, do the hair, third frame, do the hair, etc. Because those are all going to be the same color. This way you're not changing your colors constantly, and you don't have to keep swapping around through your palette, and it becomes a little bit easier to track things that you might otherwise miss. Like for instance, I sometimes might forget to do his ear, because that's such a small thing, and I might forget it more often if I'm trying to do all these other colors and remember to do all of them at once. This is another example of why binding previous and next frame to your key bindings is probably a good idea because it will save you a bit of time. And it's also good to scrub back and forth to make sure that you haven't missed anything in this process. But overall, you can use whatever coloring method that you're most comfortable with. Personally, again, I just find that paint bucket is the fastest for this step. On the note of the paint bucket, I use settings very similar to the wand. Area scaling is turned off, it's referring to reference layers only, and it fills up to and including the vector path, and anti-aliasing is off. If you refuse to use vector layers and you instead use raster layers, you'd actually want to turn on area scaling a little bit, so that way your fills will go slightly underneath your line art. 
Sometimes as well, colorists will often use very bold and diverse colors in just this phase as they're easier to see and catch errors, and then they'll replace them in the actual palette using some other process. But for our purposes, we'll probably just want to use the direct colors themselves. You'll notice as you're doing this phase that if you did not close your gaps properly in the last step, you will be suffering for it. This step is so much easier if you don't have to keep correcting things. And just think about working in a group. If you're tossing line art to a colorist and there's a lot of gaps in the line art, imagine how much more work you're making for them. Now, if you want to do any smearing in your animation, there are multiple ways you can do that. You can have the smears drawn directly onto the frames, but sometimes you might want to have the smears coming over top the frames. You can make a final animation folder above everything, and you can add the smears to this animation folder on cells where they're relevant. Remember that smears should follow the path that an object is taking. You can use them to imply more motion than you have going on. As mentioned before, there are many different ways to do smears. They are no means mandatory for good animation, but they can add a little bit of flair to your work. Now, if you're someone who wants to use multiple layers in your animation folder, this is also possible. I've made a duplication of my document so I can demonstrate this using just the line art. First, make your animation folder as normal, but instead of making the first frame a raster layer for color, make it a group. Assign it to the timeline as normal. Go through and use new cell to sync up more frames just as you did before. These will also be groups because the first one was a group. From here, you can add as many layers as you want to these groups. If you like to keep your colors separated, for instance, so that way you can recolor them later or you can toy with colors and things like that, this is a great way to do it. It's a very non-destructive coloring method as well. If you'd like to have extra organization, you can also even still have your line art in here, and you can just select multiple frames from that to set them all to reference layers so you can go by and color those quickly. The downside of all this is that it is much slower to work with and edit. You have to be discerning if you want to use this method, because it's not going to work in every situation and it's not always going to be useful. If your techniques allow for it and want it, it's here for you. Additionally, while this method could be used for shading, I would advise not doing anything too complex with it because you won't have the advantage of using onion skinning to make sure that your shadows line up from frame to frame. Trying to do the shading completely by eye is going to leave you with some inconsistent looking shadows, but we're going to cover how to do shading next time. As a preliminary tip and a teaser, treat shading like you do with line art. But since this animation wasn't meant to be shaded, I'm going to export it now. To export, you just have to go up to File, Export Animation. Do note that CSP cannot handle transparent GIFs, or GIFs if you know your punny tech history, but if you want a transparent animation, you can do an animated PNG or a PNG sequence that you can import into a video program. Do note as well that by default, CSP does scale down the size of a canvas a little bit when you export, so make sure you set it to the size that you want. Anyway, for the average user, this has been everything you need to know about CSP animation. If this seems like a lot, that's because it is. Animation generally is a lot of work, but it's very rewarding, and CSP feels great to animate in. Keep at it and you'll be pumping out cartoons and animation loops in no time. But what about shading, you may ask? Well, do not worry, because I will cover that next time.